Welcome back, Chappelle. All right, welcome back to your, or honors, excuse me. Welcome back, honors. Uh, so welcome back to your second flipped lesson of the year, all right? So today in class, we got started off talking about like Mesopotamia a little bit, right? We were like, we did a little pre-assessment activity that showed us uh, how much you know, quote unquote. Uh, so we are now going to start diving deeper. And then in class today, we talked about like the geographic conditions of Mesopotamia, why it was a, a venerable area to try and make uh, a civilization on, and why it was so mm, solid, I guess we could say, right? We talk, uh, But now what we're going to do is we're going to get into kind of like, this is kind of like a table of contents section really quick, right? So I'm going to overview the groups of people that have lived there, all right? And then we're going to get into culturally the things that these different peoples produced that are enduring and massively important impacts, all right? Okay, so over the centuries, many different people have lived in this area because it's a collection of different independent states. Go ahead first and foremost, get this idea out of your mind that Mesopotamia is like Egypt, all right? Because Egypt, ancient Egypt, was one centralized area, whereas Mesopotamia, on the other hand, was a huge region, all right, also known as the Fertile Crescent, right, the cradle of civilization, that actually was a massive swath of land. Instead of being one centralized area, what it was is powerful city-states began to pop up and try to take over the entire region, all right, and then actually try to consolidate, rule over them, things like that, right? Now, the big ones, okay, are... Sumer, or also known as Sumeria, right? Which is in the southern part, which is about 3500 to about 2000 BC, all right? And then you got the Akkadians, right? Who I don't even really give any credit because they didn't really do anything, all right? They only ruled for like less than 200 years, right? And they didn't really contribute an excessive amount of stuff. Whereas the Babylonians, on the other hand, and they're two different phases, you need to write this down, okay? Babylonians, all right, these two regions unified, right? Because here's the thing, in 1830 to 1500 BC, that's Babylon under the rule of Hammurabi, right? H-A-M-M-U-R-A-B-I, and we'll talk about him later on. And then right here, 650 to 500 is the lineage of Nebuchadnezzar. All right, so N-E-B-U-C-H-A-D-N-E-Z-Z-A-R, I think, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, there's a really, really cool story that if you give me a chance to tell it in class, you just got to ask, okay, uh, about Nebuchadnezzar and how he moved the world for the woman that he loved, created the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Uh, but we'll talk about that tomorrow. Just remember to ask me, all right? And then you have, of course, the Assyrians. The Assyrians are guys we're going to give their own chunk of time to when we get to the end of or towards the end of the Mesopotamian era. Now, some of you are like, well, wait a minute, Mr. Terry. Why is it that, like, you know, this region of Babylon and this region of Assyrian rule overlap? Well, it's actually because the Neo-Babylonians are the ones pushing the Assyrians back and then taking it away from them, right? So the way it really goes is Sumer, Akkadians, Babylonians, Assyrians, Neo-Babylonians, right? But let's talk about the commonalities they had between all of them. All of them developed a system of writing. All right, so, because here's the thing, the original forms of writing systems actually came out, ooh, whoops, sorry about that, uh, there we go, ah, all right, actually came from the region known as Mesopotamia, right? Now, really, really quickly, before we go any further, let's talk about how writing has three different distinct forms, right, and it's progressed throughout time. Now, the very, very first type of writing that is very, very simple is a pictogram, right? It's a picture to show meaning. Hieroglyphics are a primitive form of pictographic writing. And then you have ideograms, which is a sign that represents a word or an idea. This ideogram system was used for cuneiform, right? As you can see, these different little dots and little like slashes and things like that each had certain meanings as they re repeat themselves. But here's the problem. We can't really translate it, right? Then you have the last one, which is what we use today, all right? Phonetics, okay, which is a sign that represents a sound. And phonetics are the basis of most writing systems when you're looking at the Western sphere of the world. When you're looking at the Western sphere, actually, they are the basis of all writing systems. Whereas some of your Eastern sphered languages still use syllabic forms, kind of mixed with ideographic writing and things like that. But these are the three styles of writing that we're talking about, right? So need to know these words just so you know going forward, right? Now, the biggest contribution that 
the Mesopotamians gave to the entire world. I'm covering up this little section, my face is, but I don't want to move it because it's going to like make my like presentation go away again. The greatest contribution that the Mesopotamians gave to the Western civilizations, or to the civilization period, was the contribution of systematic writing. If you are writing every word on this slide down, you are absolutely insane. All right, so the big things that you don't need to write are things that you know you'll remember. Like, I think this third bullet point, I think you'll remember it. It's really more there for me, all right? This fourth one is probably important. Like, you know that scribes are an important thing with the name of it, and maybe, like, you probably don't even need that last one, right? So, but the greatest contribution is writing. So, because the great reason why writing was such an important step forward is because it allows for so many things, right? Going from being a primitive kind of... Uh, very, very backwards group of people, or just going from nomadic to being sedentary, which means not moving around anymore. Uh, this allows for the transmission of knowledge, right? It allows for the codification of laws. It allows for records keeping, farming, trading, taxes. Sorry, parents. All right, so all kinds of different functionality, right? So cuneiform and the writing system that was invented in Samaria is very important. And the way they did this, actually, some of y'all are looking at the Sabbath, they're like, well, how'd they even make these things? And you're like chiseling stuff in? No, ironically enough, because that would be much too difficult and would require way, way, way too much skill. So what they would do instead is they would actually go into the river bottoms, pick up these big clumps of clay, slap them down on a rock, write into it, and then leave it out to dry, and it would dry as a solid piece, right? And they would actually use a reed to, like, draw in it, right? So... Then, when it dro dried out in the sun, boom, there's your tablet, right? They'll just shape it, okay? So, scribes were the only people in Mesopotamia that could read and write, and they served as priests, record keepers, accountants, stuff like that. Just to give you a heads up, scribes were few and far between. We'll get into that in a little bit, but just because there's now a system of writing, only the elite knew how to read and write, okay? Most Sumerians, farmers, traders, herders, people like that, they had no idea how to read and write, okay? So just like keep that in mind that this is still a great contribution, but it was not a contribution of equality, right? It still only belonged to the elite, the intelligent, the, uh, the educated, the upper echelon, right? So as society evolved, the very first form or formal system of writing developed is gonna be called cuneiform. There's some other ones that bounce around in these like primitive writings, like Sanskrit is another one, a very old one, but cuneiform actually in translated into modern day languages, the meaning wedge shaped, all right? Cune meaning wedge and form of course meaning shape, right? So as you can see, it's all these little like triangles that are laid over top of one another. Now, unfortunately, this dates back to 3500 BC and we can't understand any of it, all right? So we actually don't know how to translate it because there was no way to actually figure it out and there's not really any pictographic writing. And also there's only one reason we can even understand hieroglyphics now. It's called the Rosetta Stone. But we'll talk about that later when we talk about Napoleon like way, way further down in the year, right? But cuneiform is then gonna spread to Persia and Egypt. And it's gonna become a vehicle for growth and the spread of civilization and the exchange of ideas among cultures, right? So through this though, right? Through this whole writing system and things like that, now there's a vehicle for education as well. So Mesopotamians, now that there is a form of writing, now have the ability to use that writing system to teach it to others and then also use it to transmit knowledge, right? So Mesopotamians are going to create the very, very first formalized ideas of school, right? Collectivized education. So Sumerian writing is going to be so complicated, though, that it takes scribes years. They had to study for years to figure out how to write in this kind of stuff. And a scribe, just so you can have it like a heads up, is a person who copies documents before printing, or in this case, copies documents before tableting, I guess. Now, here's the other crazy part about it. The scribe, like every single elected official, government official, higher up status person started off as a scribe. All right? So they all began their careers as scribes, and then they end up moving forward into society. Now, here's the really, really messed up part. Students were all wealthy males. Female students and female scribes and female reading and writing was not allowed in Mesopotamia, which ironically enough, if you look back at like hunter-gatherer societies, they're almost uniformly equal, right? So, but then if you look at, so there's this biologist, this evolutionary biologist named Jared Diamond who wrote a fabulous book that I'm absolutely obsessed with, obsessed with called Guns, Germs, and Steel, and he conjectures that he believes after the invention of farming, that actually led to uh, men believing that they had like a higher status 
above women in societal speaking. So it's actually kind of crazy when you think about it. So scribe training, though, was also very strict. And ironically enough, I'm ranting and raving about how women should have been allowed to be scribes in ancient Mesopotamia. But after I tell you what they had to do, you're probably going to be like, I don't know if I want to do that. Now, scribes are going to be often caned as a punishment. All right. So caned as in like a reed from off the river. If a scribe was to make a mistake, they would actually be caned. All right. If they are not writing fast enough caned right like so they would actually hit with this reed repeatedly as a form of punishment okay so it's absolutely insane now did they learn other subjects though of course they did as this writing style begins to blossom and grow and now we can actually record new things they're like you know what else we could do we could we could record how we use math we could record uh what plants what how they grow we could do uh like we could we could write stories we could make stuff up right so as this, this, this invention of writing is massively important because it gives us the ability to actually have educate. You can't have education without writing or else it's just verbal records. And the problem is, go ahead and jot this down somewhere, verbal records are not nearly as accurate as written ones because they can be changed over time, right? Very, very easily, actually. So these schools are going to begin to set a standard for all of the other city-states outside of places like Samaria and even our education systems today of the idea of a well-rounded student, somebody who knows multiple things. And some of you are like, what kind of math were they even doing in Mesopotamia? So funny enough, they would actually have to do math for grain systems, uh, crop yields, things like that, how much was made every certain year to try and understand if certain growing tactics were working versus others. Math was also then gonna become the basis of a calendar system to try and track flooding. And then the other crazy part about math as well was it's gonna be used to create the system called the base 60 system, where they would actually use the number 60 to actually like measure certain things, but particularly time, right? 60 seconds, 60 minutes, etc. the base 60 system. 60 as in 60, 60, 60, 180, right? So like actually understanding like three of these is a straight line, 60, 60, 60 degrees, right? So now the base 60 system was a major thing. Now then, you're gonna have your very first story, all right? So your very first epic tale, it's called the Epic of Gilgamesh, right? So Epic Gilgamesh is the very first work of great literature, right? Following the invention of writing, the Mesopotamians created, we believe this was invented in Samaria first, uh, they designed a very fun little mythological figure that they had, right? His name was Gilgamesh, right? So Gilgamesh is much like the uh, modern day Hercules, right? So he is super strong, uh, tall, very big, huge beard, flow, uh, goes through a form where he's kind of really, really cocky. Uh, one of my favorite stories about Gilgamesh um, is actually one where he fights this huge naked wild man named uh, Enkidu. Enkidu. Uh, and so Enkidu is this man that was made by the gods to try and check Gilgamesh's ego. And um, so he, they actually, out of the fields, created this man who was covered in hair and could run like deer and jump like antelope and like had the strength of 10 men just like Gilgamesh. And they end up having this huge brawl. And then, of course, in the long run, they end up becoming best friends, which is super funny because it's supposed to help him check his egotistical attitudes and his ruling styles, right? So the epic itself also mentions a great flood, right? So Gilgamesh, ironically enough, is a six-column tablet that tells the entire story story. It tells the creation of humans, animals, cities, rulers, and it does talk about a great flood, which is actually really, really creepy when you actually look at it, because that is not the only story that involves a great flood, because if you pay attention, almost all religions connect in culture and even factual events, right? Because we actually have a lot of basis to believe that there is a good chance that Noah could have very well experienced some type of great flood, because actually, funny enough, towards the end of the like uh, late Pleistocene area, era, towards the end of uh, like cold snaps and many ice ages, there was a huge amount of glacial melt, right? So we're looking right now at a map of England, right? That is England and Ireland, and they're actually above, right? That's an island now. But you see all this red? All that red and then those little stars within the red, those are all old abandoned cities that we found underwater, which is my ultimate nerd job. Ultimate nerd job, underwater archaeologist, hands down. So now the crazy part about it, though, Britain used to be connected to France, right? But due to all this glacial melt, right, and the rising sea levels, 
there was a huge flood. There was a great flood that actually turned Great Britain and Ireland into islands. And this is just one area that it actually impacted. The Mesopotamians, on the other hand, reached catastrophic flooding, right? That knocked out towns and cities and things like that, which is then going to affect their religion, right? And what we're going to do tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow is we're going to start right here. Okay, we're gonna start talking about their religion a little bit, their gods, their goddesses, some of their stories and stuff. I'm gonna tell you how they actually read and like thought they were like speaking to the gods, right? We're gonna talk about ziggurats and their big temples and things like that. But that's where we're gonna stop for right now. And I hope you guys have a great evening. I'll see you guys tomorrow, honors. Have a good one.